Hi everyone, my name is Kaisi Zhang. Uh, I'm, I sit in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation's Technical Oversight Committee. I'm also one of the leads of the, um, the newly formed um, Cloud Native AI Working Group. Ha very happy to be here. Hi, I'm Ricardo Aravina, and I'm one of the leads for the uh, Cloud Native Working Group in the CNCF, and I'm also a co-chair for the CNCF Tag Runtime. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Alalita Sharma, and uh, I am a co-chair for the uh, observability tag in the uh, CNCF, as well as uh, part of the GB, the governance board of the CNCF, and uh, maintainer on the open telemetry project um, in the observability set of projects that the CNCF has. Super happy to be here today and uh, please be ready for your questions as we get ready to uh, have a Q&A later. Over here. Hey everyone, I'm Madhuri, I'm founder of Philotl. I've been in container ecosystems since uh, 2015, worked on Flocker project. If you're old enough, you would know what Flocker project was. Um, and before that, I worked at uh, VMware on virtualization and spent some time on databases at Oracle. Um, really love cloud native uh, ecosystem and the community and uh, excited to talk about all things AI and uh, CNCF. All right, so, uh, it so turns out that all my panelists are from Bay Area. So Bay Area is well represented here in Paris. Um, so before we get started and dive deep into the discussion, uh, I would like the audience to give some call outs and what are they looking forward to from this discussion? Like any call outs, shout outs? You, you, you can like shout it out. <laughs> Challenges for AI workloads, anything else? LLMs. <laughs> Batch supports are here. Uh, when I had asked this question last time, someone told me, or someone asked me if they can upgrade to Kubernetes control plane using LLMs. <laughs> all right, okay. So be assured that all of these uh, points are gonna be covered in this discussion. Uh, so to start off, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start off with uh, Kathy and uh, diving uh, right into it. Right, like with accessing AI infrastructure is kind of difficult right now. Mm -hmm. You need uh, access to GPUs. So how do you see uh, access to artificial intelligence infrastructure being democratized uh, from an open source perspective? Okay. Um, so we, we all know that AI is evolving very fast, but accessibility to the hardware GPU is still a challenge. Um, when we um, think about AI um, training or inference, we usually associate, it, uh, associate them with um, GPU. But actually, you can run um, AI inference on AI accelerated uh, CPUs. So if you have you know, challenge accessing G uh, GPU, you can try your AI inference um, applications on CPU with accelerate, AI accelerators being turned on. Uh, another area that can help, you know, um, to simplify the ac accessing and the usage of GPU is to build a abstraction layer on top of, you know, different uh, hardware vendors uh, GPUs and uh, build a, a generic uh, API layer. Um, that is, you know, um, vendor neutral and also works across um, different uh, GPU architecture and different uh, um, computing uh, engine, whether it's a GPU or CPU or FPGA or, you know, accelerators. Um, as we know, right, it's not, I think it's not realistic to require an uh, uh, AI developer or uh, AI scientist to know the ins and outs of every, you know, vendor's GPU architecture because they are all different, right? And then if each vendor has its own um, APIs, 
you know, then, you know, as an end user, as an AI developer, you have to understand all these APIs. And once you develop your application on one set of API, it will be hard for you to port it to another um, um, architecture, another, another vendor's uh, GPU. Um, so to uh, a newly formed um, foundation called UXL um, Foundation, that was created uh, recently to address, um, the, I mean, this problem to achieve this goal. So the foundation will build an uh, abstraction layer uh, and also a unified uh, set of API um, based on uh, one API open programming model, which can work, you know, um, across all the different architectures, architecture, GPU architectures, and different vendors. And so this will. Um, um, greatly simplify the end user's use of, you know, the uh, lower level hardware. Um, also help, you know, um, I mean, promote uh, accessibility to the, uh, to the GPU. So when you develop your app on, you know, on one vendor's uh, hardware, you can easily migrate to another vendor's um, hardware and, uh, you know, um, and makes your life much easier. I really like the call out for the uh, the hardware abstraction layer, which is vendor neutral, uh, and and also the unified API calls over there. So thanks for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but taking the abstraction layer one step ahead, uh, how Ricardo? How do you see uh, cloud native being more relevant to artificial intelligence, more specifically from uh, say OCI artifacts or distributed training? Uh, yeah. So. Uh uh, typically, like LLMs uh, that are very popular now are distributed using a GUUF uh, file format. But uh, most of you were probably familiar with Cloud Native and the OCI spec, uh, so how containers are distributed. So I see maybe uh, a synergy between that format and uh, GUUF and, and OCI working together so you could distribute your models across different cloud native environments. Uh, so you can take advantage of all these registries like uh, uh, Harbor or other cloud native open source projects that help you distribute um, container images. Uh, so that's that's one way. Uh, I think also the the way you, the fact way to run in AI uh, training and inference will be on cloud native uh, open source, uh, or ideally, if you're talking about creating open source models. So I think that's another uh, way that that's going to happen in, in going forward. And I think also of, of uh, how you could use AI technology to to improve cloud native environments and architectures. Uh, generative AI is one thing, but uh, I, Predictive AI has been around for quite a while, and it's been used in several environments, for example, de detecting anomaly detections on API latencies. Uh, so that's been around, and, and generative AI is going to even enhance that further. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, I, I, I like the call out for uh, the use of predictive AI, uh, the anomaly detection, and also parts of it which have been kind of sort of used in Kubernetes mostly through audit logs and things like that. So yeah, thanks for that. Uh, but talking about AI applications even more, Alolita, how do you see profiling AI applications going forward? Um, I think, you know, again, as we uh, come upon the world of LLMs, which has, uh, you know, become the buzzword now, um, it's not that, you know, work in this space, in, especially in building large-scale AI apps has not been around. But I think you know it's always a sweet moment when you see the uh, cloud native, uh, the cloud native infrastructure scale, if you will, converge with the applications that are being run for uh, for AI using AI, right? And um, especially you know as uh, Raj just called out, it's like so so you're building AI applications. How, and do you now, how do you optimize them, right? And for optimization, again, you need observability and specifically uh, understanding both not only the hardware, the infrastructure that you run on, but also 
the applications that you are running on it, right? And for that, um, again, going back to um, profiling, if you will, profiling is one way of kind of really understanding the behavior of software applications. Been done for a long time, all the way from the OS, from, you know, many of you have worked on Linux um, uh, profiling itself. Uh, and, you know, in the AI application space, the same applies. What is different today is really the advent of, you know, large language models, for example. And you, what you are seeing now is that not only does it matter to have resource utilization understanding, which observability and profiling specifically gives you, but also, you know, understanding performance of not only your software application, but also your models, your model inference, and your, um, the actual, you know, um, hardware that is used for AI applications, right? Including GPUs, not only CPUs, you know, accelerated uh, uh, CPUs, but also GPUs and others. Um, Profiling has many aspects that already, you know, have been covered. But I think that, you know, as we go forward in um, understanding some of the areas that can be improved upon, uh, there are gaps in what you can observe today, right? And especially for AI applications. But that's something that, again, I think we'll dive forward. Yeah, I, I I can't wait for the cloud native goodness to be extended towards artificial intelligence, mostly from a profiling perspective. So yeah, that's that's like a very exciting space out there. But shifting focus to the end users now, uh, Madhuri, what do the mar market trends look like? Like what what uh, work what works, what doesn't work for the users? Uh, that's a really good question. So from an end user's point of view, our end user uh, needs, end user persona, which is a data scientist, needs a cloud native platform that not only meets their needs, which is don't make me bother about where the GPU is located, what's the price of GPU, what are these Kubernetes stack components, all of these things. Just give me a cloud native platform that is opinionated, that is recommended by the cloud native community, that also lets me, in addition to letting me run my um, AI ML applications, it also reduces the nag I have to face from the finance teams and the CISO. So the finance persona is the second stakeholder who is going to be concerned about are you actually using the money that you that the company is paying you to use right um, are you uh, using exactly what you need or are you use are you spending more than what you're actually using so the finance persona is a second stakeholder that that the data scientist needs to be concerned about and the third one is the CISO so how are your data gravity requirements being satisfied is the is the platform that you're using going to be um, HIPAA compliant etc and what doesn't work is um, the time for this platform is now. So we don't have the luxury that we had with the container orchestrators where we figured out, okay, they had the Swarm, Mesos, and Nomad, and Kubernetes. Let's take five years to figure out where we have to converge on, right? So if the cloud native community doesn't come up with this cloud native platform recommendation within the next six months or so, the industry will go and build their own, and it'll be a bunch of bespoke uh, stacks that'll be running around that are not going to take advantage of all the community effort that we put into with the cloud native standards. So we need to get to these, this platform as, as soon as possible. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I understand the need for the reference architecture. And talking about reference architectures, that's that's one of the deliverables of the working group that's been formed uh, in CNCF uh, on artificial intelligence. So shifting gears and uh, talking about the working group, this morning we got the white paper for cloud native and AI uh, released uh, by the working group. So huge shout out to all the folks involved in that. Uh, and Ricardo being one of the uh, co-founders of that working group, how is your experience been? What are your plans ahead? How does it look out? Yeah, my experience has been great. Uh, a, a lot of folks interested in the space uh, joining a community effort uh, to, to put, I don't know, like maybe 20 pages of 
cloud native AI, we're look, talking about challenges, talking about the history of AI, the history of cloud native, and how they, they're merging together now, especially with generative AI, uh, and, and some of the opportunities uh, ahead. So pretty excited uh, about things to come, and uh, some of the things that we're thinking about are, you know, creating a reference architecture, or also a landscape, but you might be familiar with cloud native landscape, but we want to create one that is more targeted towards cloud native AI. And we also want to make it easier for uh, people to get started using things like Kubeflow, uh, have a, like a maybe constrained environment where people can just play around and, and understand the full life cycle of machine learning, which includes uh, data prep, uh, creating the models, storing the, the models in, in a model artifact, uh, and then uh, pulling those artifact, uh, model artifacts and uh, serving them in, uh, in, a, in a microservice type of environment. Uh, so yeah, so it's a lot, a lot of exciting things and looking forward to the, the new things and, and, and we hope that folks in the community get interested and, and, and join the working group. So, yeah. yeah, actually I think uh, we welcome you to join that working group. We have um, bi-weekly uh, bi -weekly meetings and uh, yeah, you can contribute and together we can drive you know, the cloud native and AI together. Absolutely. I love the way the working group is shaping up. So if you're interested in where the action is happening, all things cloud native and AI, that's the working group to join. Uh, but taking things ahead and uh, talking more about observability and the tag observability, how are your efforts shaping up Alolita and like how does it look for tag observability to benefit AI? Actually, uh, very proud to say that, you know, when we started the working group a few months back and we announced it at KubeCon in Chicago, uh, the tag observability was one of the tags that actually, uh, you know, one of the co-sponsors of the working group. And so super excited with the work that the, um, you know, uh, AI working group has done. Um, I think that, you know, in general, in the, uh, and this is going back to one of the comments that Madhuri made, is that it's very, uh, you know, you're seeing a changing landscape because one of the areas that is happening here is that obviously, you know, we all live in the world and breathe in the world of Kubernetes and, and cloud native, right, today because we all uh, operate in the cloud native computing space. And, and um, many of our tool chains, as well as the projects that are related to that, the open source projects in the CNCF, are very foundationally you know, revolving around the universe of Kubernetes. Now, that also means that as the world of uh, AI, in, uh, especially uh, different types of black box models, different types of models that uh, come in, different training pipelines, different types of workflows of data come in. There is a whole layer of assets, of uh, components that are coming into the space, which you know, not only does Kubernetes as a uh, foundational mod, uh, layer need to handle and be able to have visibility into, but also the related spaces that you know we have in the landscape.cncf.io, for example, whether that's um, uh, app delivery all the way to security or observability, also need to be able to you know have projects which are actually very aware of some of the new generation of applications coming in into the space. And what that means is that in observability specifically. Uh, there's a lot of discussion happening on some of the open source projects, for example, as to what does that look like, right? Because you have interoperable open standards, for example. Uh, do you have open specifications for what LLM metrics look like? Uh, what model behavior looks like? What, you know, what do you define as uh, normal thresholds, if you will? And, and, you know, those discussions need to evolve into uh, different spaces such as, you know, having the ability to have more white papers in specific areas as well as semantic conventions defined which are really standards for being able to interoperate across different, you know, data workloads and AI. 
applications models as well as uh, lower level observation comp components that exist today like open telemetry, which is a collection pipeline mechanism, for example. And um, that, again, uh, as Marjorie was saying, time is of essence, and that actually needs to uh, accelerate. So I'm hoping that uh, you know, with the, some of the discussions also going on in the tag observability, uh, we can ex help accelerate that, and also you know, again add more, join more forces with the working group, the AI working group itself, to uh, you know maintain that momentum. Absolutely. Uh, so if you are more interested in like defining the semantics for observing LLMs, then you know which tag to join. Yes. Uh, Kathy. Uh, you are one of the tech leads of the working group and also a member of the technical oversight committee for CNCF. Uh, which innovative areas do you see, particularly in the open source realm, which are much more relevant to artificial intelligence uh, and where cloud native can contribute? Um, I think um, cloud native can contribute to um, two areas. One is uh, uh, performance. Uh, for example, um, when uh, AI inference uh, application sometimes do not need the whole GPU to run it. You, you may, I mean, for some AI inference application, you may just need a fractional GPU. Um, so if we can, I think cloud native can develop, uh, you know, a GPU partition or a GPU or virtual GPU aware scheduler which will schedule your, uh, the AI inference workload or maybe some fine tuning uh, onto a fractional GPU. That will help save you know, the, uh, the, the, the cost. Um, and so that, that's one thing. Another is, you know, um, the, um, for example, you have, um, for the distributed um, training is very popular today. Um, so for distributed training, it usually involves um, communication between GPUs on the same server or across servers, right? And, and you know, um, the communication uh, link speed uh, or cost um, for, for between uh, intra-server communication speed and cost is much, you know, the, the link speed is much faster than the inter-server communication link, right? If you zoom in on a GPU, you are going to see different links connecting the different components. So if we can build a GPU topology or hardware topology, and also the link cost aware scheduler, that will help you know, schedule the, your AI and service workload, service application onto a set of GPUs that renders the best performance, right? Because it takes the link cost up between the different components or cross servers, right? Or cross switches into consideration. Uh, another area is, you know, um, the cloud native can build, um, we can build a, um, auto, a, a auto scaler, which will, um, which is guided by the actual real time um, GPU or CPU or memory, you know, um, utilization uh, metrics. Uh, no, based on that metrics, it can automatically scale out or scale in or scale up and scale down. And then to meet the uh, current resource needs of that uh, application AI service. So we all know that, you know, um, some application AI application service has peaks, traffic peak and valley, right? So without that auto scaling mechanism, you probably need to plan for the peak, right? To, to guarantee its service. But if with that mechanism, then you know you can save you know your resource cost, and then you know let that auto scaler to automatically you know scale up and to you know, scale down based on your your you know your real time usage need. Yeah, I, I really like those callouts. Thanks for that. Uh, we've we've heard from the leaders within CNCF on uh, what what lies in the future. So it's only fair. Uh, to flip the site, get a pulse from the end user. So Madhuri, going ahead to you. Uh, if the end users were to ask one or two things to the cloud native community, what would that be? 
a cloud native platform that is um, that that comes with a reference architecture that satisfies the three stakeholders the data scientist persona the finance persona and the CISO persona that's great uh, uh, I, I think a sustainable uh, and a responsible future is what lies ahead of us uh, but moving forward uh, I'd like to uh, go ahead and like keep uh, one or two questions rolling, like which each of y'all can take a stab on. So, yeah, what areas would you recommend for people to uh, keep in mind while building op open source projects, which are in the intersection of cloud native and AI? Okay, I'll go first. Um, I, I think the convergence of cloud native and AI will drive. Uh, enterprise AI, age AI, and uh, PC AI, um, and leveraging technologies uh, such as you know um, fractional GPU um, allocation, and uh, like the GPU utilization telemetry guided auto scaling. Um, so this will, when you develop a solutions in that scenarios, uh, I think you know uh, you need to pay attention on. Resource, um, uh, resource sharing and isolation. Because in those scenarios, the GPU resource is, or CPU, even C, uh, AI accelerated CPU resource is limited. It's not like, you know, in public cloud. It's in your IH or in your, um, um, you know, in your AI PC. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, Ricardo, would you like to take a step? Yeah, I, I think um, one of the cloud native areas that is very popular now, or it's, or it's gaining a lot of steam as WebAssembly. Uh, and I think um, you could actually use that technology to serve machine learning models. Uh, and one of the interesting areas is the edge, where you could actually create an inference uh, service at the edge and uh, make that maybe like an AI agent. So there are a lot of conversations about using AI agents. Uh, in yeah, so basically, if you have an LLM, you, you could partition uh, the responses or, or, or the workload of LL, uh, multiple LLMs. So at the edge, you would have one part of the uh, compute happening at, at a, in, in a smaller um, language model, I would say and then send that over to a centralized uh, larger uh, language model and do the rest of the processing there. So that's one of the architectures uh, that a lot of folks are talking about creating, and, and I think Cloud Native can help in that, in that area, in, and also WebAssembly, because it's very lightweight at the edge, and, uh, and there are some other projects that have actually been using uh, this um, pattern, an example is that was on edge. It, it's a CNCF project. So yeah, take a look at that. And, and I think that's something that we can see yeah. more of in the future. Taking machine learning to the edge. Huh? <laughs> yes, I mean, in fact, I think that um, uh, given that, uh, you know, there is um, AI everywhere, uh, I would say that the edge uh, as well as the uh, core is equally important from a infrastructure standpoint. And uh, being able to observe you know, AI applications on the edge as well as at the core means that you can operate you know, AI applications both at the edge and the core. And, and it is you know, fundamentally right now that um, as Ricardo just said, you know, they can only run smaller models on the client, on the edge. And, and that's due to many reasons, if, uh, you know, uh, hardware included. And as the world shifts, you know, most folks want to, uh, you know, with, with concerns on, and rightfully guardrails for data privacy, security, and fair use, um, having that those guarantees are best at the edge and being able to guarantee that the infrastructure and observability and security and everything that goes with infrastructure 
is available end to end, uh, that's the opportunity that we are, uh, you know, uh, actually, I see as the next boundary where we need to address and work towards. Absolutely. Uh, Madhuri? Yeah, to add on to the edge uh, conversation, um, providing cloud agnostic compute for your uh, emerging workloads, your LLM, Gen AI workloads, cloud agnostic compute that honors uh, your CISOs requirements and also is cost aware. Um, that would be, I think, a very interesting area that there is a lot of opportunity for open source ecosystem at this intersection of cloud native and AI. Yeah, totally. And actually, I would say that, you know, for that to happen, it's very important to have open standards and interoperability. And that's why, actually, cloud native open source matters. Absolutely, right? It's, it's, it's all about fostering collaboration between the end users, researchers, maintainers, collaborators, keeping open source at the heart of it. Uh, with that, I would like to open the floor for questions. Uh, anyone having questions on top of their minds? What would they like to hear in terms of like challenges in AI workloads or anything on those lines? Hello, thank you for your words. Uh, I'm just uh, wondering how is the relationship with the hardware developers? Well, we know NVIDIA and the like, like cloud native community. Uh, this is like my, my main, uh, yes or no. Uh, idea of how, how this communication goes uh, between developers of hardware and the cloud native community of AI. Yes. So I think the question is how uh, vendor developers and cloud native community communicates or collaborates. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, can take a stab at it. So um, this alludes to my earlier point about the need for going to market as soon as possible because of the demands of AI ML are today. So the way we are looking at it is uh, the hardware vendor plus the cloud provider providing the, um, the Kubernetes um, out of the box uh, solution plus a uh, multi-cluster platform sitting on top. So have an opinionated stack that stitches these three layers together and go to market quickly. That enables us to go to market quickly. So uh, the ecosystem is definitely working with hardware vendors. Um, happy to dig deeper into it in a follow-on. Yeah, just a short uh, add-on. Uh, I think we have a lot of folks from those uh, vendors uh, working uh, in the CNCF community. So we have folks from Intel, NVIDIA, I'm um, not really sure if we have anybody from AMD, but, but we, we're trying to work with all the different vendors so, so we create those standards uh, that can work across all of them, right? And then uh, all of the end users can benefit from them. Um, in, in Cloud Native Computing Foundation, there is a, a, a I mean, I would say it's, a, it's called TAB, um, so if you are an user, yeah, you're welcome to join there. And then to, you know, like for example, if you see some challenges um, when, uh, for you to use the cloud native infrastructure, right? You're really very welcome to, you know, to voice your, 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 your opinions there and also to influence the cloud natives, uh, you know, technologies. And also, um, as we all mentioned, there's a cloud native AI working group. We really would like, you know, the end users to join that working group. You know, whether you are develop AI developer or AI scientist or AI users, right? To give us your, you know, feedback on the challenges and pain points. And then we can work with you together um, solving those, right? We have quite some cloud native experts in that working group, um, but we would like to, you know, close integration. Well, you know, with, you know, the end users. Um, also, uh, as I mentioned before, I think, you know, down the road, a close integration from the upper orchestration layer with the hardware layer, there are several layers stack, right? A closer integration um, will be very good, very good for the, for the larger community, right? So we provide a very simple uh, end user interface on how to allocate the low layer GPU resource or how to, you know, dynamic adjust your resource boundary you know, make your life easier, right? You don't need to understand the infrastructure. You don't need to understand the hardware. 
you can concentrate uh, as an end user, as an AI developer, concentrate developing your AI models, right? And let that uh, infrastructure layer automatically take care of all the either HA or resource scheduling, resource allocation, resource, you know, scaling. Yeah, or, or, or like, like, you know, any resilience, you know, um, dis uh, uh, you know disaster recovery, all take care, in for, take care for you. Uh, I think with that, we come to an end. Uh, we have a lot of other questions, but we'll take them in the hallway. Uh, this has been a great discussion. Thank you so much for joining the panel. Thank you everyone for attending uh, and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you.